I'm Anthony Leeds and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the third of these discussions about um, how we might address issues relating to obesity and diabetes. In previous conversations I've discussed with Professor Mike Lean the diabetes remission trial that's been undertaken in Glasgow and Newcastle and I'm pleased to be able to be joined today by Professor Navid Sattar, the Professor of Metabolic Medicine at the University of Glasgow. Uh, thank you for joining us Navid, um, who's going to very briefly describe the trial that was undertaken there on people of South Asian origin and the implications of that. Navid. Yeah, thanks, Navid. Tony. So Thank you. The, the trial uh, in um, called Standby was effectively supposed to be a feasibility study of 25 uh, South Asians, half of whom we gave uh, a low-calorie diet for around about three months and a half of whom we had as controls initially. We um, undertook the same intervention, low-calorie diet, about 850 calories, over three months to see is it acceptable, does it uh, lead to weight loss, um, and is the mechanism of remission, should it have occurred by a reduction in liver fat because we also measured MRI. The average age was roughly in their uh, mid-40s, the average BMI was 32 Tony, the weight was about 88 kilograms, so somewhat lighter than white communities. But what we were able to show, even though the trial was done over the course of the pandemic, so lots of complications, we managed to gather as much data as we possibly can was that five out of the 13 people who got the low-calorie diets lost on average uh, around about six to seven kilograms in weight and, 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 four, and around about 38% had remission compared to zero people out of the 12 in the controls. And in addition, we saw a, around about a 7% reduction in liver fat. So it broadly suggests that we can see remission with, tight, with low-calorie diets in South Asians when they lose about 7% weight loss, which, or slightly more than 7% weight loss, and that is parallel with the reduction in liver fat, suggesting that they're actually making the liver more insulin sensitive by clearing out some of the fat. So the same mechanism that we saw in direct. Um, the final points I would make to it, the people who were in the trial generally were okay with the intervention. I think they would have liked a bit, few more different types of um, um, you know, tastes to the particular locality diets, you know, perhaps fitting more of a South Asian ethnicity, so something we need to work on, Tony. Um, generally, no safety concerns. And I think the key point of the trial, Tony, is a proof of concept that you can get remission in South Asians as same in whites with re a reduction in weight and that the mechanism seems to be a reduction in liver fat. So I think it's very important for other people now to take that pattern and take it further. Can we sustain that weight loss? Can we sustain that remission going forward? Hmm. So what, what, what would you like to see happen now? What, uh, ideally, if all the resources were in place and everybody was cooperative, what would you like to see happen now? I, I would like to see uh, a number of centres around different South Asian communities and South Asian countries um, look at our results and develop their own, either their own service, because it does work, but probably before that is actually develop some new, you know, new types of interventions, new tastes to the, sort of the low-calorie diets, you know, the kind of shakes and soups. Can we, can we develop localized products in these areas? And then can we trial them, whether we need trials or whether it's you know, just, an, you know, just an open trial, can we actually use them and show that individuals can lose weight in, in, in South Asia? And can we also sustain that weight loss or how do we actually best help people sustain that weight loss once they've lost their weight to keep their diabetes away uh, once they've had remission. So that, I think, is what we need. A range, I mean, and actually, there's a saying in the UK, as you know, Tony, one swallow does not make a summer. One trial on its own is good, but actually we now need to follow up and say, can we improve upon it? Can we sustain it? How do we make it sustainable? And what we really need is a, a range of activities to just take that forward to see, can we actually improve the mechanism by which we do this to help our community to have sustainable weight loss and and a least reasonable du durable remission of diabetes for five, six, seven or eight years. Um, and I think those are the things we need to do now, Tony. Yeah. Um, what particular challenges do you think there might be in this particular community in relation to maintaining the weight that has been lost? Because that is a problem in all the trials that have been undertaken and there are various ways in which this can be addressed and you can identify people who are more at risk of weight regain. Um, did you see anything particularly from this particular study in terms of giving clues about that? No, well, the part of the problem with the trial because of pandemic, we had hoped to have a, like a, a weight um, sort of weight maintenance phase, but we had to curtail that because of the pandemic. So this trial, the average follow-up was only 105 days from the point of, uh, of, so it's not long enough. It's not enough, you know, like one or two, three or four years, like direct. So we need those trials going forward. 
What I would say to you, Tony, if we're being very frankly honest, the thing that's going to be harder in South Asia than it even is in the UK is the food culture. Food culture is changing so rapidly in many South Asian countries. It's becoming more towards what we see in high income countries, more fast foods, less food eating at home. And there's lots of temptation. That's not to say people are bad. It's just that there's temptation to eat, you know, and also the culture in South Asian communities is to eat together uh, whenever there's some kind of event, you know, whether it's a wedding or something else. Um, and that provides um, difficulty for lots of people, uh, you know, and we, we all have cravings and it's very, very difficult, Tony. So are we going to solve the remission forever? With these, no, we're not. What we will find is a group of people who perhaps maybe a you know a small proportion of twenty to thirty percent who after the low calorie diet get it, change their lifestyles in a sustainable manner, become more physically active, um, retrain their palate to have a better quality diet subsequently, and and keep their weight down and keep their diabetes away at least for ten fifteen years. And if you can delay diabetes from say developing it at forty five to say sixty five. There's a potential of huge benefit in that particular, you know, in that scenario. So that's, I think, what we need to achieve. But I really would like countries to focus on the prevention of obesity, and that's the food culture around everywhere in the world, Tony. And no country is different, and it's very, very hard. And no, and as far as I know, no country has effectively achieved that yet, have they? No, they haven't. No, they haven't. And actually, every country is paying lip service um, to um, tackling the, you know. I mean, the food industry has to make a profit, but there also has to be an equilibrium where the food industry is making a profit, but actually the quality of the things that they put on the shelves are far better, less dense, um, more nutritious, um, more fiber, and so on and so on. But unless the government's actually forced them to do that, they're not going to do it, Tony, because profit trumps everything, unfortunately, and that's the reality. Yes. That, let, let's move on then now to uh, another area. I, I know you published a, a paper in November of last year in which you discussed the sort of general issues about the way in which modern medicine is focused on the consequences of the development of metabolic disease rather than the underlying causative factors, which will include, of course, obesity. And you discussed the fact that essentially uh, by ignoring um, the management of overweight and obesity, we're actually just not, well, we're not solving the process of the problem and that um, we're, we're just sort of treating the problems individually when they subsequently occur um, so that we have a, a growing cohort of older people in almost every country in the world who've developed various aspects of cardiovascular and metabolic disease and accumulate very large numbers of um, tablets. Um, there's a very splendid uh, piece of artwork in the British Museum at the, at the rear entrance at the north which shows the average number of medications consumed by men and women in the United Kingdom throughout their lifetime and towards the end of life it, it's visually amazing the amount of consumption of medications that occurs towards the end of life yeah uh, and it's worth seeing that artwork just to give that visual impression of the scale of the problem uh, which can be addressed of course and the interesting thing is that in the direct trial there was a reduction in the use of medications not just for diabetes but also for hypertension and no doubt actually as you know I work in the Arthritis Institute in Copenhagen uh, we know that use of medications would be reduced in osteoarthritis if we were to achieve effective uh, weight loss as well and no doubt in other conditions as well when the evidence is produced um, so what are we going to do about that how can we how can we turn this around so that people start to think about the the real upstream as you described it the upstream causes so that we don't have to deal with these very uh expensive downstream consequences but also very um uh unpleasant for the individual we haven't really addressed it from the point of view of the suffering that human beings accumulate as they get older and develop more of these diseases that's a nice summary i i, I would add a little bit more context um I mean, this is not to blame anybody or any individual or any system that's created this. The reality is there's been a lot of success. We've managed to substantially reduce cardiovascular mortality. We've managed to reduce smoking in many high-income countries because of you know various uh, policies. Um, and we've also managed to improve uh, the life expectancy of many chronic conditions, so like people living with rheumatoid arthritis because of biologics or heart failure because of therapies. But what we've for what has happened and crept up upon us at the same time, as, as all those secular trends have changed and because the food culture has changed, 
more and more people have now developed obesity sooner. They're living longer with excess adiposity because they're no longer dying prematurely from cachexia because of rheumatoid, because you don't see it very often, or from heart failure. And what then happens is both the absolute BMI that people reach at different ages has gone up, and the overall aggregated exposure to excess weight has gone up. That means both the acute effects of obesity like diabetes and the medium effects like heart failure or the chronic effects like arthritis, they're all multiplying and adding and adding. So that then leads to many of our patients um, in our wards, as you completely say, or get to the 50s and 60s, if, they, if we haven't tackled their excess adiposity, by the time they get to 60 or 70, several of them have, or many of them have, three to four to five conditions, which in some form or another can be linked back or exacerbated by their excess adiposity. So a patient, for example, living with type two, who also has chronic kidney disease, has a bit of NASH, osteoarthritis, and is a little, you know, is, is either uh, low self-esteem or has got depression. You know, that, and who's got a BMI of 33. You know, that's, that's a disaster. Whereas if we had managed to intervene with that patient when he first developed diabetes, to tackle the weight in addition to tackling just the glycemia, we may have slowed his progression to kidney disease, stopped his progression to arthritis, improved his quality of life, and actually, and also made his workability, his ability to work in society for longer. So there's a benefit for society, the patient's quality of life is substantially improved, and actually we might also save the NHS lots of money. The question though, Tony, you're gonna to ask me is, how do we get to tackle that adiposity at that stage? Um, and that's the really difficult bit because we can do it just to a modest extent with lifestyle. And of course, these new drugs are coming forward as well. I'm not saying well, I'm an advocate of all these drugs. It's not my job to sell these drugs, but there are now new drugs coming forward that may also help us in addition. It's a question of how we embrace them and when do we embrace them. These are the really difficult conversations we need to have now with regulators. Yeah. Do you think one of the other um, problems, and I'm not sure that we've got enough information, is identifying the individuals who are at risk of developing the specific associated comorbidities? So we have, you know, at this stage, as far as I know, we're not really able to, although we can, but we don't do it, with, with regard to diabetes, for example, we've got screen, simple screening things which are available as online tools, and I should add to those listening that on each of these talks, I add on the links to various online tools in the different countries for identifying risk of diabetes. Um, but we haven't really got sophist sophisticated methods of identifying those, for example, who will develop osteoarthritis later on, or those who will, well, we, nope. yeah. we, we have not really sophisticated enough in identifying those who will benefit from the effort that needs to go into weight reduction and, uh, and weight maintenance. What do you think? Well, I, I, do you think I would say two things. I think if somebody's living with excess weight and they've got one condition, they will benefit regardless. I think what you're asking me, are there, you know, because the resources are not, are, you know, not infinitesimal and they're expensive, do we need to target our resources of people who are most rapidly progressing towards multimorbidity, lots of conditions? And I can tell you there's a huge amount of research going on around the world to try and develop multiple scores, to try and pick up an individual who not only is risk of diabetes, but also chronic kidney disease or fatty liver disease or OA. So I think this is a massive um, area for current and future research, Tony. And, and I think the funders have started to recognize that as well. We need to go down those lines. So you're completely correct. Do you, do you think one of the areas that we don't fully utilize, for example, is proteomics, where from small blood samples, you can measure a whole range of blood proteins well, and you can look yeah, at different no, no. panels for various things like insulin resistance or inflammation and then you can even on people who have no existing disease you can actually identify those who are likely to go on to to so, problems in yes, five ten years no, you're completely correct proteomics may be part of the part of the equation in terms of a new risk score but it's of course is quite expensive we can do pretty well with even existing biomarkers we use in clinical care and what we probably maybe need to do is even the simple things plus one or two simple other measurements measure them slightly longitudinally so you can measure the trajectory of change, Tony, rather than just a one-off measurement. I think, I think we've got to become slightly more sophisticated and, 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 and try and work out how we best identify those individuals. But the technologies available to us are now substantial. We also have AI. We have lots more data on many individuals. So I think those things will be achievable in the near future. And then we can, we can target our, our, our resources better at those at the highest risk initially. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So... Uh, the last question then is what 
uh, knowing what you know about the trials that are going on and the information that will likely be accumulated over the next five years or so, in five to ten years' time, what do you think we will be able to do that we can't do at the present time? What do you imagine we might be doing that you we're not doing at the present time? Oh, gee. Um, I think we'll be uh, targeting ac excess weight uh, early in the course of many diseases. The question is how can we do it with a combination of lifestyle? We can certainly improve the way we do lifestyle, not just low-calorie diets, Tony, but other things. I also think that some of the newer drugs will, are going to start changing the paradigm of some diseases. Just It's just a reality, Tony. Um, we're going to have four or five trials that report the next four or five years in people living with excess weight and, and fatty liver disease, chronic kidney disease, with heart disease. And if these drugs show not only benefit in the primary condition, but also benefits in other conditions, then their use will be prioritized sooner as well. So that we're going to have a whole new paradigm where we focus much more on the journey of, of the life course, the journey of weight loss, both with lifestyle and with drugs earlier in the course of diseases to prevent lots of multimorbidity and hopefully improve the quality of life of individuals. Now, the final thing I would say is, is, is contentious. Many people don't like the fact that we're using drugs for weight loss. What we need is a combination of lifestyle and weight drugs used in a clever way, which is cost effective and helps the economy and society in general. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, with that, we'll close. And thank you very much indeed for talking to us. And uh, hopefully, perhaps we can have another conversation at some point in a few months' time and see what more we can cover. So, Navid Satar in Glasgow, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. P pleasure, Tony.